the next group of panelists need absolutely no introduction. With a combined listenership of about 300,000 plays per month, the US-based Dig podcast and the UK-based Verso podcast represent some of the best of progressive media in the Anglosphere. In a world of clickbait and sensationalism, both podcasts remain committed to incisive, in-depth, critical analysis of the big political issues of our time. From climate breakdown to criminal justice, from the rise of the far right to the rebirth of third worldism, Dig host Daniel Denver and Verso host Eleanor Penny are routinely in conversation with the most cutting edge thinkers of our time. And when it comes to incredible guests, tonight is no exception. Joining Daniel and Eleanor is tonight is Professor Lale Khalili, currently a professor of Gulf Studies at the University of Exeter. Lale's career. Lala's career as an academic, public intellectual, and writer spans many decades. Her work quite literally strikes at the heart of the modern world, with books such as Sinews of War and Trade on shipping and capitalism in the Arabian Peninsula, and Time in the Shadows in con on confinement and counterinsurgencies. Her public writing frequently appears in the London Review of Books, where she writes about topics such as logistics and trade, infrastructure, nationalism, political and social movements, and policing and incarceration. Her upcoming book, Extractive Capitalism, Commodities, Cargo and Cronyism, will be out next spring. And finally, joining our panel tonight is the MP for Islington North and former Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn has been the local MP just up the road since 1983, and he has spent much of that time not only advocating for the people of Islington North, but for a range of causes and social movements, including on climate justice, economic justice, anti-war struggles, LGBT rights, anti-apartheid, and Palestine. <laughs> Just earlier this month, Corbyn was re-elected to represent the constituency for the 11th time this time as an independent MP. So without further ado, I am thrilled to hand over to host Daniel Denver and Eleanor Penny. Hello everyone, wow. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to our fantastic MC Dahlia for that fantastic introduction. I can't wait to get stuck into some increasingly urgent questions about how to meet a global series of crises, overlapping crises, with progressive global solutions. Dan, would you like to kick us off? Yes, thank you. Uh, it's really great to be here tonight. Um, we talk about internationalism a lot on the left, and we have a lot of questions on that subject that we want to discuss tonight. But I want to start off by asking, how has internationalism shaped the British left, particularly given Britain's long, sprawling, often brutal history of, of empire? And, and Jeremy, let's start with, with you, because we'll be repeatedly returning to your experiences advocating an internationalist and anti-imperialist position as Labour Party leader and, most recently, winning as an independent MP for Islington North. Thanks, and uh, thank you all for coming tonight. And this, I hope, is going to be a really good, um, a good discussion. And I'm glad, pleased you've started with the issue of internationalism and the British left. Uh, I'm sure this is a very well-informed audience, and you would know of the power of the growth of national identity in the 19th century by the British state, 
the um, emergence of a, a sort of uh, loyalism towards empire promoted by the growing popular media of the day and that encompassed quite a lot of working class leaders and leaders of trade unions. It wasn't a given that every left movement or trade union would become an anti-imperialist force in the 19th century, in fact quite the opposite. And so those that had a genuinely internationalist outlook could trace their sort of political thought right back to those that had opposed the slave trade in the 18th and 19th century and those brave union leaders like cotton workers in Lancashire that had stood up um, against the slave trades and at great personal hardship to themselves. And so in the late 19th century, there was this growth of um, a genuinely internationalist force, which was also growing at the same time in France and in Germany. And uh, you had a, a sort of alliance of various left forces to oppose the coming war between the European superpowers. They're brought together through Working Men's International, they're brought together through ideas, and they're brought together by uh, tireless traveling around Europe by a number of people, Juarez, particularly Keir Hardy, and later George Lansbury and others that did all of that. Their whole point was to try and oppose the First World War. They tried and they were overwhelmed by that sense of um, that somehow or other from uh, the whole country from being anti-war on Sunday three days later had become virulently pro-war and shouted down those that had led them into an anti-war position. Keir Hardy died at the start of the First World War. That to me was the point of difference within the British Labour movement and that continued for a very long time. In the 1920s arguments about uh, whether or not we should be, the labor movement should be supporting imperialism, dominion status around the world, or should it be supporting colonial liberation struggles or not. Um, this is a shorthand way of leading into the issue of the way internationalism was dealt with much later on by the Labour Party and the trade unions, and the way the Cold War had a massive influence on them. The, um, Attlee government is the most contradictory thing there ever was in British history. Uh, very brave and uh, very innovative on uh, economic and social policies within the UK in the sense of the National Health Service, council housing, planning, public ownership, Town and Country Planning Act, all of those things that were so essential to the um, changing the lives of so many people in post-war Britain. But its international policy was appalling. Uh, at the same time as promoting all this social justice at home, they were conniving with um, <coughs> colonial forces in Vietnam to shut the Viet Minh up and using Japanese prisons of war to shoot Vietnamese people in order to stop them gaining independence until the French colonists could come back. They did the same in Indonesia. They did the same in Malaysia. They did the same in, a, in attacking um, the independence movements in Kenya. And so it's that contradiction that's there. So within the Labour Party and the Labour movement, there's always been this huge debate. And um, we were talking earlier, just before we came in, about the role of Fenner Brockway and people like that in the Labour movement, who stood up for a genuine internationalism. And those that um, basically saw the whole thing as a, a, a Cold War tool. And so I've always found it very hard to argue for genuinely international positions within the Labour Party and the Labour movement. And it's uh, the area that I suffered the greatest attack um, for being leader of the party wasn't the economic policies that we were advocating. They didn't like them, but they could sort of live with them. What they couldn't live with was the idea that you would have somebody in government who said from the very outset they're never going to use nuclear weapons and they wanted to um, dismantle international military alliances and instead always search for peace, justice and examining the causes of war. And that in a sense what goes on now, it still goes on today. But what I think is encouraging, for all the horrors, and they're vile, the horrors that have happened now in Gaza and the West Bank, and all the loss of lives that's gone on there, 
there's a huge international movement grown up of solidarity, probably even greater than the movement of solidarity with the Vietnamese people that grew up in the 60s and 70s. And I think this is going to be one of the defining features of politics going forward. And maybe we can discuss this a bit further tonight. How that internationalist thinking can also become anti-racist thinking, can also become economic justice thinking as well. So we're always told we're powerless, we're always told we're a minority, we're always told we're extreme. No, we're not. We're absolutely at the center of wanting a world of peace, wanting a world of justice, and not wanting a world run by the arms trade and run by the lobbyists that, that bring all this about. I could go on for ages about this, but I've got a feeling our hosts are going to shut me up in about 10 seconds. I wouldn't so dare. So I'll stop here and hand over to you. <laughs> Yeah, that. No. <laughs> We're absolutely going to dig into um, all of that way more from the Labour Party to the strange ritual by which you're supposed to pledge allegiance to the complete destruction of organised life on the planet, otherwise you're some kind of crazy person. Um, I mean, like, would you press the nuclear button? If not, why not, Jeremy? Very, very bizarre. Um, England does not exist, we can all agree on that. Uh, but first, um, I would love to know more from you, Lale, about um, what you mean by internationalism, right? The idea of what is genuine internationalism has been uh, raised by Jeremy. And I would love to know more about um, how, in your view, that differs from the kind of multilateral organizations that we might be familiar with, such as the WTO, the UN, that stop me if I'm going completely off piste here, might not have our best interests at heart, right? Capitalists have very effective institutions of global coordination. What kind of um, examples can we be looking at um, when we're thinking about what our own kinds of progressive internationalisms might look like? I mean, I, I, one of the things that has always bugged me is the fact that people talk about the international community and what they usually mean is the United States and its poodles. Um, where actually, when you look at the world, uh, the, inter the real international community, the vast majority of the billions of people that are often under the boots of uh, states um, that are often the allies of the United States and United Kingdom, um, th that vast majority of people have a completely different conception um, of our relationship to one another across the different borders. And I think part of what we need to do is to cultivate that sense of belonging, that sense of being together, that sense of collective obligation to one another, particularly at this moment where um, the, with, with the climate crisis and with the increasing violence of the states against all the ordinary people, certainly in Palestine, but we are, we're seeing it also in Kenya. I think Assad mentioned that earlier. We're seeing it in Bangladesh. We're seeing it in a lot of the rest of the world. With this increasing violence, with the climate crisis, we really do need to build a solidarity from below that challenges that idea of an international community which is sitting in Washington, D.C. or in the United Nations building. I mean, one of the things that's interesting about the United Nations is that in the moment that it emerged in the aftermath of the Second World War, as much as the United States and its allies, the winners of the Second World War, were trying to make it a forum for the projection of their power, there was like a little tiny sliver of a moment where the countries of the global south that were fighting for some form of political sovereignty and for forms of decolonization tried tried to use it as a kind of a forum or as a tribune in order to make sure that they could in some ways uh, play out uh, some of their aspirations. Um, the new international economic movement, for example, was one of these um, uh, movements that was played out through um, the United Nations. But of course, one of the things that we also know is that both empire and capitalism are incredibly supple. They in, they're incredibly good at co-opting these institutions. And the force and violence of the empire has translated into those original anti-colonial folks that stood for something in the moments after the Second World War. Um, either being, as uh, actually I think Assad mentioned this in the previous panel, being assassinated, being overthrown, or being replaced with further poodles. And I think 
It is in this kind of a constant back and forth, this constant struggle, that a form of solidarity can emerge rather than from the top-down form that we're seeing. The other thing that I want to mention is that I think Jeremy's absolutely right, that there is always a um, tension between, uh, in all the left, in all of the global north, between a kind of a nationalist left that wants to focus on bread and butter issues within its own small, somewhat provincial um, kind of domain and a more internationalist left that sees our fates as interconnected. And that's always been the case, um, uh, both the unions and the left parties. And I think what has been really important is that resistance from the global south has been often the factor, the catalyst that has pushed forward this, uh, the, the, the possibility of a left arising. And I think we cannot underestimate the extent to which Palestinians' resilience, strength, and resistance has been necessary in the building of solidarity across the globe. So I think those, that's a point that I really want to draw out. Jeremy, as as you mentioned before, when you were Labour Party leader, it was not so much over domestic policy issues, domestic economic issues, although the right hated those, they attacked you constantly over Ireland, over Palestine, over cenotaph etiquette, over, <laughs> over questions that have to do with empire and, and internationalism. Why, why is it? the case that internationalism and anti-imperialism are such particular red lines in, in Britain, and I would say also in the United States, similarly, for the left? Well, it's, I think it's because it's linked to the, the power of global capital, which has such a massive influence on our lives. I mean, cunt countries all imagine that they run their own economic policies. They don't. Those economic policies are heavily fashioned by the power of very, very large corporations. And I thought it was, it was very funny the other day when there was this big meltdown of the computer systems all over the world. It was I was, I was very surprised the Russians weren't blamed immediately, but I didn't <laughs> I, I didn't hear I didn't hear that uh, anywhere. Um, it was a complete breakdown. The health service, everything else, grew really seriously and badly affected. Not one of our commentators in any of the media said, well, actually, is it such a good idea to have um, every aspect of our public life uh, run by a completely unaccountable company called Microsoft based in the United States? Shouldn't we think for a moment about the power of monopoly capital in this, in ru running, and in this case, severely damaging our lives? And so I think you have to look at things in, in those contexts. And the internationalism that I think pretty well everyone in this room be talking about, be one of solidarity with those people that are trying to rid themselves of um, unaccountable power over their lives, such as what happened in Bolivia, what happened in the 60s or 70s, rather in, Ch in Chile, and, and so on, where they tried to gain control of their own resources for their own value and came up against global capital and they came across the, up against the full force of it and that is the serious issue we have to face. You also, me also mentioned this attitude about wars, arms and defence. Um, I remember once asking Tony Blair a question, well I've asked him lots of questions but <laughs> um, one of them, he was blathering on about the special relationship and um, how important it was to maintain the special relationship and how the Americans really valued the special relationship <laughs> and how this relationship was apparently very special. <laughs> and uh, and um, this was in a debate about um, Iraq at the Parliamentary Labour Party. So I said, well, Tony, thanks for all that. Um, <laughs> could you tell us what the benefits of this special relationship are. So he starts pulling his cuffs, which he always did when he either didn't know what the answer was or wanted to tell you an answer that wasn't perhaps completely true. So he's pulling his cuffs. He said, Jeremy, if I told you what the reality of the special relationship was, there wouldn't be a special relationship. 
<laughs> I thought, God, is it that easy to end it? Um, and so this idea is that essentially that British foreign policy and British defense policy has to follow in the track of the United States. This came post Second World War when the Labour government, for, as I said earlier, for all the great things it did, uh, was the main motor force in the establishment of NATO. It was more Britain than the USA to begin with. The USA for sure joined in. Attlee's argument was he didn't want the US to become isolated and he already decided he was not going to make do any links with the Soviet Union. And so uh, NATO was duly established. The Visiting Forces Act was passed and a bit later on. And we ended up then with a, a NATO essentially running defense policies for every member state, and now it's NATO who are demanding that defense spending go up to a minimum of 2.5% of GDP, rising to 3% of GDP. So we are about to have in Britain over the next um, six years an increase in defense expenditure from 1.9% of GDP to 2.5% of GDP. There is no such similar increase offered for health, for housing, for education, for environment, or anything else. We're completely dominated by NATO thinking on how we spend that money, and that has a massive effect on every other uh, issue about resources around the place. And when they had the NATO summit in Washington, the word peace didn't appear anywhere in any communique, but it was all about pouring money and arms into conflicts. And so I do think we've got to start seriously looking at the issues of military alliances and what they achieve, the power that this gives to the arms industries in Russia, in China, and in India, as well as in Germany, France, Britain, the United States, Canada, and, and so on. And with Andrew Feinstein, we've just produced this book called The Monstrous Anger of the Guns, which is designed to analyze um, the power of the arms industry and the arms lobby, and we're going to take it on tour to have discussions with people, particularly those working in the armaments industry. They're not enemies, they're people who need a job, but they're skills that could be used to do so much more than just produce weapons of mass destruction. So the issue has to be of internationalism for peace and to improve people's living standards and environmental sustainability. This is terrifying to... Um, this whole industry of military producers and think tanks that dominate the way in which foreign policy thinking goes on. And some of it is kind of almost hilarious in their contradictions. Back to Blair, he went on a political visit to um, India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. And um, he filled up the plane with journalists and, and business people, and they, they all duly went with him. So they arrived in India, and uh, whilst Blair is going to dinners and stuff with the Indian government, the rest of them are busy doing arms deals to sell um, Euro fighters and so on and so on to the Indian Defence Forces. They then get back on the plane and go to Pakistan, and they arrive in Pakistan and says, you need this equipment because the Indians have already bought it. You, <laughs> you, need, you need to be getting something even stronger. And, and so they just ended up with a massive amount of arms deals in exactly the same way that have been done in so many other places. If we're serious about peace, we've got to be serious about challenging the power of these forces that dominate so much of our, um, of our thinking. And it's devastating. All the people have been killed in all the wars all over the world. I mean, I think... I think one of the other things about this is, uh, that's really important is um, I have a brilliant PhD student. I think some of his friends are here. His name is Charlie. And Charlie's researching at the moment internationalist um, organization around the question of Palestine right now. And one of the things that he's finding, and it's um, fascinating, is the extent to which, while it's easy to reach out to the different unions to, for example, find some factions within the unions to issue internationalist um, statements or to actually organize around these issues, a, a large number of um, unionists who work, for example, in the arms industry are extremely resistant to this, and they see the arms industry as their bread and butter. We're also seeing a uh, similar kind of attachment to the oil industry in Scotland 
Scotland, where, for example, people are resisting um, the move, for example, to other forms of sustainable energy, and they're seeing in the really well-paying jobs uh, in the oil industry um, uh, something worthwhile to fight for. And so I think that, that kind of a um, dog-eat-dog dog kind of ethos that capitalism encourages also discourages forms of internationalism in those businesses that are incredibly profit producing, but also produce well-paying jobs. And so some of what we have to also address is how are we going to be able to turn people that work in these industries? How are we going to find ways to, for people to have good wages in industries that are not predicated on the deaths and destruction of millions of millions, billions of people around the world. And I think that that is one of the questions that we really have to think about. And I'm hoping Charlie and people of his generation, people of your, you guys' generation, um, will have some I'm form not that of, young. Uh, no, you're, you yeah, and you're Charlie still are still young, young ones, don't you worry. <laughs> um, we we'll, we'll have some form of um, response to. Can we also look at the role of um, media, media imagery, and media reporting that, that goes with this? Now, if I asked you, uh, in the audience now, I'm not going to do it, but if I did ask you, saying, name six wars that are going on around the world, you'd all get Ukraine, you'd all get Gaza, West Bank. How many would say Sudan? The worst party game in the yeah. world. Yeah. Yes. How many would? How many would? How many would say Congo? How many would say yeah. Yemen? How many would say West Papua? And so and so on. And so the whole thing is formed by the way in which uh, the the media chooses to narrate it and what is seen as the most serious conflict. Actually, the massive loss of life going on in Sudan at the moment. Massive mm. loss of life in in the Congo hardly any mention of it in any media anywhere. I would Bankrolled love to by British and US ally, ally the, the UAE. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I would love to kind of um, dig in more on the specifics of the question of Palestine from both of you, from basically taking account of what we can learn from the, the horrors that we're, we're seeing at the moment in Israel's genocidal campaign in Gaza, of course, not just over the last nearly sort of 12 months, but of course, over the last 75 plus years. And the, uh, what can we learn from this situation and the global resistance to, its, to it in terms of what solidarity demands of us? I'm particularly interested in this as a kind of infrastructural question, right? We've talked about how the situation is flushing out the deep hand in glove, snake eating its own tail, imbrication of state, corporations, the arms trade, and um, this is, seems to be a key question in terms of deciding where to build the proverbial or literal barricade, right? It's a strategic question. Uh, can we go to Lale first on this, maybe? Um, one of the things that's uh, really quite significant about Israel is that it is the strategic outpost of the United States out there. Alexander Haig, uh, and I quote this um, ad nauseum, so I'm sorry if among the friends you've heard me say this before, but Alexander Haig, who was the, um, I think, uh, Secretary of State under Reagan, um, actually called Israel the biggest, most unsinkable, stationary, aircraft carrier the US can have in the world. And I think that that element, um, that, that Israel is seen as a strategic outpost and as a strategic asset, is something that has to be addressed, has to be challenged, has to be in some ways fought against. And I think what Palestinians have shown over the course of, as you said, 70 plus, but actually even further than that, is that they have chosen a range of different ways of resisting. They have used forms of mass mobilization, mass strikes, they have used general strikes, they have used armed struggle, they have used forms of um, activism, for example, in the Intifada, mass mobilization, um, uh, popular committees, kind of grassroots levels and they have been challenged at every stage by some of the biggest most powerful most heavily armed uh, military organizations um, in the world and they have managed still through that to maintain their dignity 
their demand for their uh, self, um, uh, self uh, uh, for autonomous rule, for freedom, and for liberation. And I think that that's the first place we have to look at, is what the Palestinians have done and what they demand of us. So I would love to be able to sit here and issue edicts, and I'm a bit of a pontificator, so I could pontificate for as long as you need me to. But I actually think that we should, I, I'm not Palestinian myself, I think we should listen to Palestinians, and we should listen to Palestinians in Gaza, we should listen to Palestinians in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem, and the Palestinians inside as well, inside Israel, because they are also second class citizens in an apartheid state that stretches from the river to the sea. And so I think the first task is to listen to Palestinians. I think that's probably the, the single most important mm. thing that we can talk about. The second thing I think is for us to find ways of building coalitions across divides. I think one of the things that has been really exciting about watching your campaigns and across the years as both the, labor of, uh, the, the leader of the Labour Party, but also in, uh, in your most recent election win, is the, is the kind of broad coalition of folks that, that have that organized, that were excited by the possibility of the changes you were suggesting. And I think that that kind of coalition building between the left unionists, between anarchists, between um, good old uh, groupuscule kind of Marxists, and I'm sure there are loads of you guys here, so I do apologize. Um, <laughs> Ouch. Student movements, which are enormously important. I think there needs to be coalition building across these divides, and we need to find the language to talk about this in order for the internationalist movement to take root here, that we should listen to Palestinians first. I would love to throw this to you, Jeremy, and particularly um, I'd love for you to talk more about the uh, situations that you raised uh, in Congo and Sudan, for instance. This doesn't seem like a coincidence that these what are, can be essentially seen as resource wars are coming to a head and um, being kind of aggravated at the same time. And I'd love to, to us to start kind of talking and thinking interconnectedly there while still, you know, keeping our eyes on Palestine. Yeah, uh, first of all, just on Palestine, I absolutely agree with what you said. It's a question of solidarity with the people of Palestine. And yes, those in Gaza and the West Bank and living in Israel, but also please don't forget the um, now fourth generation of Palestinian refugees living in Jordan and Syria, Lebanon, and so on. They have rights as well, and they should be recognized. Too often they get completely forgotten in all of this. Um, the point you raised, about the Congo uh, and what's going on there. If you think back to the whole history of the brutality of the Congo, the way in which the European colonialists led by Leopold colonized a huge area of Africa in order to extract at that time rubber from it and also Leopold's various obsessions about um, people, artifacts and so on. And it was the most brutal regime conceivable. Indeed, it was some that was exposed by Roger Casement, who was later executed um, for his part in the, in the Easter Rising. And then when um, it, the Congo finally achieved its independence in 1961, the uh, leader uh, of the new country, Patrice Lumumba, was, ex was assassinated after less than a year in office, and he was one who spoke up for African unity, spoke up for all the principles of African freedom and liberation of the people of the Congo. And from his murder was occasioned by the uh, copper companies and others that were frightened of their resources being taken over, and also by the US not wanting what they saw as going to be a Soviet ally in Africa. And so the Congo then descended into decades and decades of one authoritarian government after another, after another, after another. And um, the Congo even now has incredible levels of mineral resources very few roads, hardly any railways, very poor internal communications, and uh, very well financed and very well organized militias effectively working for various mining companies. And so the coltan and the cobalt, which is necessary for the manufacture of mobile phones, 
and other minerals as well comes out of the Congo. Theoretically, some of it comes from Rwanda. In reality, it doesn't. It comes from child labor in the Congo, is exported via Rwanda, then bought by Glencore and all these wonderfully clean mining companies that put it onto the world market. And the death rate is running into the hundreds of thousands over the past 20 years in these militia wars to try and control the supply of those resources and the and the poverty goes on and uh, uh, to go to I've been to Goma which is on the co on the um, eastern border of um, of the Congo it's a city with tens of thousands of refugees no made up roads whatsoever yet the most amazing plush office blocks owned by mining companies and one or two incredibly expensive hotels, but without a paved road between it and anywhere else. I mean, it's kind of j just beyond, beyond bizarre. And thousands of uh, people, mainly women and children, living in refugee camps, waiting for a, um, a truck to arrive with food to keep them going. And this, we're all complicit in, in the sense all countries that are supplying those arms and buying that coal term. So that's a, a resources war. And we need to sort of understand that is the, um, the underbelly, the underside of what um, global thirst for minerals does um, to the poorest and most vulnerable people. It's not the only war that's going on. It's weapons that are going in, in to do it. So it is about solidarity we can start to mount with people going through those circumstances that we really have to think about. Jeremy, a few minutes back you said something along the lines of the Palestine solidarity movement, the Palestinian struggle being really the defining or a really defining issue of our time, what sort of possibilities for politics in general, in Britain and globally, do you see the Palestinian struggle and this explosive solidarity movement that's emerged around it? What sort of possibilities do you see that that opening in general? B both of you take, can take it if you, you want. Can. You go first. <laughs> um, I mean, I think uh, I'm, I'm bo borrowing this from someone else who said this, but. Uh, when people go, when, when we all go on protests, and uh, one of the things that one of the one of the slogans is that in our thousands and our millions, we're all Palestinians. Um, I think part of uh, what Palestine is at that moment, um, I think Assad also mentioned this. It's our past, our present, and our future. It's it's what we what is being done against Palestinians is what will be done against us when there are climate wars, when there are uh, protests for democracy. And I think um, the the nucleus of forms of organization that is emerging around Palestine. I'd, one of the things that has been really exciting for me is I have lived in the U.S. I've lived here. Um, I've lived in Iran, and I've never seen a movement that is as rich, multi-layered, um, able to take account of the different kinds of constituencies that are coming into the movement. And I think that that element of Palestine solidarity that I'm seeing at this moment um, is, is something that is extraordinary. And I think that if we can build forms of organization around it that allows for us to to, to continue to solidify those forms of mobilization, to perhaps have a place to keep the memories of the tactics and the strategies that are emerging out of it, to pass on our knowledge gained through this moment, I think that is going to be the task that we're, we're looking at. And I think that that is going to be important, not only in trying to challenge Israeli depredations, genocide, settler colonialism, apartheid uh, in Palestine um, and, and further in the region, but to address all the other depredations that are being foisted on, 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 on all of us. Because I think these tactics, these strategies, these forms of organizing, these ways of reaching coalition building 
building um, are enormously important. We've only got each other. They've got the guns, we've got each other. And we have to find a way to organize together. And I think that Palestine provides that template, or at least solidarity organization and Palestinian resistance at this moment provide that template. Right, right. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to see a correlation on a timeline between October, when the uh, uh, initial um, I incident took place and the hostages were taken and the people were killed, the protests that grew up as the bombing of Gaza intensified and intensified from, what was it, November onwards, the protests that happened around the world, the refusal of most governments around the world to engage whatsoever with those levels of protest. And then gradually, we got the um, ICC, we got the ICJ, we got a number of governments, and we got all the pressure at the UN, and we got the demands for a ceasefire, and so on and so on. And it's had an effect. It's changed the mood, it's changed the atmosphere, and it brought about the legal decisions that we've got. And I realize how successful all the protests are when in a question two days ago in Parliament, Keir Starmer answered, we're doing practical things, not like people who stand on the streets shouting and demanding things. Well, he's only doing something because people stood on the streets and demanded things. <laughs> And so the global, the global movement uh, has grown up. Yes, enormous in this country, much of Europe, but particularly, I think, impressive is the number of student protests that have taken place in the USA and the brutality with which they were treated by both university authorities, police, and so on. Actually, far worse than anything that was done against anti-Vietnam War protesters, far worse in the sort of overall attack on them. It just, even the very right of protest has been challenged. So I do think this sort of global movement in solidarity is something that's very, very encouraging. But don't run away with the idea that the left and the labor movement in Britain have always been completely in solidarity with the Palestinians. 1936, the British Labour Movement showed amazing solidarity for Spain, for the victims of the fascist takeover in Spain. The support was amazing and intense. It's where my parents' generation c comes from. The same time, 1936, Palestinian trade union uprising and uprising, not one word of solidarity or action of solidarity was taken at all anywhere in, in Britain that I've ever read about anywhere, unless there's something I didn't, I didn't know about. And so it's been a long time coming. And I remember, if you read some of the stuff that was said in the 1940s over the, uh, uh, the time of the Nakba, the racist language that was used to describe Palestinians and how they had to get out of the way and make way for settlers because they weren't capable of farming the land and stuff like this, just total levels of racism applied towards them. And uh, I think we have to um, just remember that this time there's now a generation, a global generation, that has woken up to the um, plight of the Palestinian people and watching in real time this um, genocidal acts going on in Gaza. And also, let's be clear about it, there are people, very brave people, in Israel that have also spoken up in solidarity with the Palestinian people. Don't forget them as well, because they're going through hell at the same time. My friend Ofer Kassim, who's a member of the Knesset, has threatened with just about everything, just for speaking up for Palestinians. So it's not about religion, it's not about nationality, it's about humanity that we're talking about in order to support the Palestinian people. Um, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the absurd Keir Starmer thing because the, I was on that day reading something and, um, and then I saw the news item about Starmer saying that the grown-ups are sitting in the parliament when everybody else is protesting on the street corners. And it reminded me, I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a professor so I'm going to read you guys something. Um, <laughs> but, but I promise it's worth it. Um, it's uh, Frederick Douglass, the former, um, the former enslaved African-American 
who, uh, and a major abolitionist, who said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Find out just what any people will quietly submit to, and you have found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. Power will not concede anything without a demand, and we need to keep making those demands. Talking of power conceding nothing, um, strap in everyone, we're going to talk about the Labour Party again. Um, it's historically, as we've mentioned, um, been a primary institution of colonial governance across the world, including when, it would, when it's been doing things that we like and agree with and support, like building the NHS, thank you very much, that's lovely, um, across the world. Um, so I'm wondering, particularly in light of your experiences over the last few years, shall we say, Jeremy, um, how you um, uh, think about that task of being in against the state, that's the framework we use, how to, um, uh, how you're thinking about the possibilities and limits of the framework of using the levers of kind of historically hostile institutions like the nation state and also like labor movements that articulate themselves on the level of the nation state when we are kind of trying to push for progressive internationalist demands. Like how do we work through that problem? That's a short question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a... I often get this question put to me saying, well, um, is the road to socialism through parliament and elections or is the road to socialism through um, revolution and uprising or is there some other way? I mean, I, I wouldn't want to use the words third way because I'm a bit confused with Peter Mandelson then. <laughs> but um, the, it's, it's not really a binary choice. It's not really an either or thing. If you fight and contest an election on the basis of a, a demand, Frederick Douglass point, and uh, you gain a mandate from that. That means you've got to try and carry that through and try and make sure those demands are actually met. Are they going to be met by um, a, a simple vote in Parliament? No. Are they going to be met by a government saying, well, fair enough, that's it, we'll, we'll, we'll give you everything you want? No. It's, a, it's always a combination of lots of things. It's a combination of um, those that have been put into a position to speak out and those that want to be in a position to speak out by protests, by marches, uh, and by demonstrations. I mean, there's those wonderful Walter Crane cartoons saying the cause of labor is the hope of the world because it's the, it, what he meant by that was the cause of labor is the unity of working class organizations, principally trade unions, in order to make a collective demand that can indeed demand and force and get things, uh, get things from, from the state. What we now have in, in the world are two actually broadly similar forces that have grown up. But there's a danger of where the far right are on this, and I'll, I'll just very briefly make this point, that the global crisis of 2008, 9, 10, the financial crisis, essentially brought about by uh, greed and so on in the US subprime mortgage market and elsewhere, brought in that whole period of the most massive austerity all around the world. And the fight back against austerity and the fight back for improving living standards and getting wage demands, which continues now, because the working class living standards in Britain have still not caught up with 2010. So all the strikes of the past two years are actually a product of that financial crisis as much as anything else. And with it, now, this global movement, global movement in support of the Palestinian people means there's been a growth of an international aspect to what we do. And so if the governments that are now faced with the issue of falling living standards, growing inequality and growing poverty in our society, look around you in this country, look at the number of rough sleepers, the number of, home, number of food banks, the number of homeless people, the obvious shortages within the health service and everything else, and say, well, if that's not 
resolved by putting more resources into those, then there's Tommy Robinson and all the rest of them out there who are ready to say the whole fault of everything to do with the NHS, with housing, with education, with transport, anything you care to name, is all the fault of the boat people that have come from Calais. And in, by some mad process, some people will give that a hearing. The rise of the far right is waiting and ready there unless we can deliver an improvement and a community cohesion in what we do. And uh, in our own small way here in this borough, we had the election campaign in North Islington. And um, when we finished the campaign with the big rally on Highbury Fields, I just said, look around you. Look at the person standing next to you. Look at the person standing behind you. Look at everybody. What are you? You're men, you're women, you're black, you're white, you're different, you're different nationalities, you're all kinds of things. You probably have quite a wide variety of views, but what unites you is, you believe there should be a fairer society, you believe nobody should go hungry, you believe every child is valuable, you believe that everybody should have access to health, education, and housing, and you're totally united in doing that. And you're not ever gonna go and start blaming people because they happen to come from Bangladesh, Afghanistan, or anywhere else, and that's why the labor movement, in its widest sense, has got to be more demanding, more persistent, and more aggressive in its demands on the new government now than it's ever been before in order to meet those demands of people to live in a decent, fair, and just society. Because if we and others across Europe fail in these demands, the forces of fascism are rising all over Europe. They have to be opposed. That means we oppose them by our unity and our opposition to racism in any form. Can I, can I quote another African-American, uh, Malcolm X? If you're not careful, the newspapers will have you hating the people who are being oppressed and loving the people who are doing the oppressing. The people who are oppressing us are not the people coming over in the dinghies from Calais. They're the people that are, uh, that, that, that are doing everything they can to ensure that the uh, hedge funds and the uh, um, uh, private equity firms uh, and, and the people down in the city continue to flourish. And I think that that's what we really, really need to focus on educating people about. Uh, and the private press, yeah. Lala. Yeah, I think we could um, extend a uh, now internet famous slogan of my enemy doesn't arrive by boat, he arrives by limousine, into he arrives by private jet. Um, <laughs> truly. Or helicopter. Many <laughs> options. Um, Lala, we've, uh, we've talked a lot about internationalism, mostly in terms of anti-imperialism in this discussion, but in the first program with Macrodos, uh, there was a lot of really incisive analysis of the capitalist world system and the place of, of, of Britain within it and the British labor, and, and the struggles of, of people in the global north and how those connect to people in the global south. You are an, an expert on the, the infrastructure of global capitalism today, uh, neoliberal global capitalism, maybe it's a different type of global capitalism, maybe we don't know quite what it's becoming yet, but what what do we need to understand about the architecture, both inherited and emerging, of the global capitalist world system today, and how we need to analyze that system in order to fight it, to produce, to achieve global economic justice for a global working class? Um, really easy question. <laughs> um, I mean, I think one of the most important uh, elements of that question is that everything that we try to do in order to um, transform the world around us, whatever it is that um, governments decide, whatever agendas the governments decide to produce, whatever the social movements do, whatever um, political parties do, I think the, sim simple, the simplest, most fundamental question is who benefits? Who benefits and to whose detriment does this policy um, work? Because I think if we begin to break everything down about who it is that's benefiting from this 
um, architecture, as you say, of global capital, it becomes clear that, the, for example, the massive movement of capital from the global south to the global north doesn't necessarily enrich the people sitting in this room, although, of course, it benefits them marginally by, for example, funding, um, I don't know, some of the public services that they have. It benefits the very rich people who live in Mayfair and in uh, estates in the shires. Um, I think it's really important to ask who benefits. Um, and that question of who benefits isn't just a question of movement from the global south to the global north. Only last week there was a wedding in um, Delhi or Mumbai of the Ambani family child, which cost six hundred million dollars. A wedding over the course of one week was nearly a billion dollars in a country in which people don't make $300 a year. The vast majority of the population doesn't make $300 a year. I think we have to ask that question of who benefits everywhere that we are, because I think despite the fact that all of us make a lot more than $300 a year, we have probably more in terms of our futures and in the kinds of solidarities and relations where we will build, we have more in common with the ordinary Indian person than with the Ambani spending God knows what on caviar and Rolex watches and massive diamonds and rubies for their guests. So I think that that recognition of inequality and the way it's constantly reproduced at national level and internationally is fundamental to that architecture of capital. Let's talk a little bit more about how that's changing as well, because we are arguably at least seeing the, um, the fall of at least unquestioned US hegemony on the world stage as an economic power and also as um, a power with the reins of global infrastructure of extraction. For instance, we can look to China's Belt and Road infrastructural project and uh, the impact that that has had on uh, what we might sort of very broadly, baggily, and maybe inaccurately called the global south, right? Um, and so how is that changing what the shape of internationalism and uh, uh, resistance to capital uh, and what that needs to look like in, uh, in the near future? I think that's a really important question. And I think part of the reason that it's important is because while things are changing, there are some things that are still constant. So yes, the US hegemony has been shattered and I actually think in no part because of Palestinian resistance. But, but I think that there is a lot of other stuff that's going on, as you said, with Congo, but also with, this, with the popular movements um, and struggles that um, uh, Thea mentioned in the earlier panel um, and other forms of organization, the US hegemony is on decline and yet, the United States still spends more on its military than the next nine countries put together. So they are maintaining their, their, the empire uh, through coercion. The US still has the highest number of billionaires in the world. It still has the largest economy in the world. And I think that China's rise, uh, which is being turned into a kind of a bogeyman by, by the United States and those in power there, um, could potentially affect US hegemony, but not in the short term. I mean, I think that this is a change that is coming. So what does this translate to? Um, in, in terms of global solidarities. I think what this translates to is also something that either James or Asad mentioned in the previous um, uh, panel, which is that the people that are working in the factories in the Shenzhen um, offshore um, are probably having a lot more in common with people who are factory, uh, working in factories in the near shore. So uh, people working in the peripheries um, of Europe or working, for example, in what used to be the free trade zone, the NAFTA zone um, in the borderlands in the United States and elsewhere. And so I think it is this, this kind of a convergence between the interests and the livelihoods of people in different parts of the world also requires from us to have different and new tactics of organizing, which allows for um, organizing unions, for example, or, or political action or labor action or community actions across the globe. To that, I also think that it's really important to mention a number of different kinds of movements that have emerged. And again, because I work on Palestine and the Middle East, this is the example that, that comes to mind immediately, which is, for example, organization, mobilization in ports, 
um, in, in, a lot of the, in, in a lot of the world. For example, on the west coast of California, you had the Stop the Boat movement, which brought together unions, and the unions, even, even the good lefty um, unions there, were actually pushed to the left by community organizations. And what was amazing there was the community organizations were both Palestinians and the Black Lives Matter movement, which we were trying to resist the importation, for example, of armament um, by Israeli ships. Um, we've had organizing by uh, port workers in Genoa um, and in Barcelona and in South Africa um, against the movement of armament in this instance to Israel, but also in previous mo moments to Saudi Arabia. And I think that there is, again, this is really exciting. And this is something that we really need to find a way to replicate across different kinds of settings. Finding forms of solidarity that also tap into the anger that ordinary workers have against their bosses. Turning that anger into an internationalist form of organization that works not only on behalf of us, but on on behalf of our brethren, our sisters, our comrades halfway across the world. I think it's great. I'd just like to sort of throw in the extra thought that the US economy seems to have um, serious, very serious structural problems with it. In that apparently, the easy vote in the Congress every year is the annual increase in, in the US federal debt. So you put it up by a couple of trillion each year and you just carry on and on and on. And um, <clears throat> then carry on with the pork barrel politics of handing out stuff to favored people in, in different states. And so the debt levels of the USA are astronomical by any standards anywhere in the world. The same US government and the same US representatives on both the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund would put any African country, any Latin American country under the most appalling kinds of special measures if they've got anywhere near the debt levels that the United States has. The whole thing is unsustainable in that sense. And where the problem arises from the US is that the de-dollarization of trade around the world, which is now developing quite fast, has a huge impact and, generally speaking, will reduce the attraction and the value of the dollar. The BRICS countries, which are considerable and powerful, I do question the human rights records of quite a lot of the BRICS countries, but just look at the, the economic power of the BRICS countries now setting up their own currency or currency and trading arrangement. This means there's increasingly a fundamental change in the world's power structures towards China, away from the United States. The Chinese influence around the world is largely an economic one, increasingly diplomatic and political. They managed to patch together some kind of deal between all the Palestinian factions, whether it will hold or not, I don't know, but they made an effort to do so. They managed to get the um, Ukrainian foreign minister to go to China to discuss the possibilities of some kind of ceasefire, peace deal, or whatever it's going to be. And they've done all this without having bases all over the world. The US has 800 bases at least all around the world and spends more money than almost the rest of the world put together on arms, uh, on arms and defense. So I think what we're seeing is a process of fundamental change um, in, in world, world political structures. And I think we should push it along as fast as we can by always making the demands for peace in order that we can uh, pursue an equality strategy which deals with the issues facing the world, the climate issues, the environmental issues, and the social inequality issues that exist around the world. Surely that is what unites the left around the world. It's not anything else that unites the left better than the call for peace and the call for social justice and equality. And that means much better practical relationships around the world. If I could just may say so, just by way of information on the um, 14th of September, Peace and Justice Project are holding our second international conference, one day conference at Queen Mary College. Uh, please come along, you can register online for it and it'll also be a hybrid conference where we're practically talking about attacks on trade union rights, 
in India, in uh, some parts of Latin America, and in the USA, and the growth of the global peace movement. It's our way, working with Progressive International and others, of bringing voices together all around the world, not on an over-ideological basis, uh, but on a basis of saying, well, actually, we're here together to try and get union membership in Amazon. We're here to try and get union membership in Starbucks. We're here to support coffee producers around the world who have been grotesquely exploited by um, coffee importers around the world and, and, and things like that. And that's a great way of building up a sense of real international solidarity. That really is practical work and practical way forward. Should we uplift some voices right here, right now, with some audience questions, perhaps? Oh, I thought we were going to ask another <laughs> question or two first. Well, we, I'm just, uh, we just sadly, we've got to go to the pub in about 20 minutes. And um, that's, a, that's an appointment which I am duty bound to keep, um, as well as I think local legislation bound to keep. Um, would uh, you like to um, kick us off? Uh, you can go first. I need to open the door. <laughs> so um, let's uh, kick off. We, um, you may have seen arriving in your inboxes in the last couple of weeks a form to submit questions to our lovely panelists here. We have some for you. Um, let's choose. Hmm, let's see. Okay. Um, this is one from, I have from Elio. They would like to know um, what kinds of international political interventions or relationships uh, you guys think are possible or necessary when it comes to dealing with the environmental impact of global trade, right? This question of uh, the environment and of course the urgency of that, uh, of that horizon uh, maybe does shape uh, the the kinds of answers that we can reasonably give, right? Of course, we need to build a global movement of solidarity, but we need to build it about, I don't know, yesterday or 20 years ago, right? So what do we do? Demand and question the way in which trade treaties are drawn up. Um, demand proper environmental standards at each end of the supply chain, because a whole lot of people in Europe have managed to achieve actually quite tough environmental regulations on manufacturing processes and a whole lot of other things. But in reality, by deregulation in developing countries, we're actually exporting pollution, exporting environmental destruction and issues like that. Likewise, a, a trade deal in manufacturing goods with um, Japan, with Australia, and so on, what does that mean other than ships going 12,000 miles, carrying cars one way and fridges the other, uh, and so on. The pollution levels created by global shipping are absolutely enormous. And the built-in obsolescence that goes with it and all that means you're on an endless accelerator of greater consumption and greater pollution. So it comes back to some very fundamental questions, very fundamental socialist and Marxist questions about do you produce for profit or do you produce for need? Do you manage to organize society where you share wealth out, basic income, all those kind of arguments come to the fore in order that you produce for long-term use rather than short-term profit and short-term gain? That's where the environmental issues come into it. And so the environmental solidarity is important. And um, those people that are suffering the consequences of the appetite of global oil companies for dragging oil out of the ground irrespective of the consequences, such as the huge damage done in the Amazon forest uh, in Ecuador and other parts by, um, by, in that case, Chevron, the damage that was done in, by Shell in Nigeria and is still done and so on around the world. We need to be in solidarity with those people who are the victims of that environmental destruction just as much as those that are victims of the new, uh, the, the new fad of lithium mining all around the world. So let's just remember solidarity with those people that are trying to protect their own environment. I mentioned earlier the war in West Papua. A lot of that is about, the, uh, about the, the mining companies destroying the livelihood of people there. They're rebelling against it, so the Indonesian army are going in to try and shut them up. I think as a professor, I would say we need to educate ourselves a lot more about what's going on around the world, because I think that one of the things that is um, quite uh, striking to me as I study um, 
various kinds of environmental movements that are emerging in a lot of the rest of the world is that we don't know the specific circumstances and context of again, I'm speaking as a professor, but of, of, of all of these different kinds of movements that are emerging in a lot of different um, uh, continents, actually. And I think that part of it is part of our job here, um, in addition to forms of local organization across a range of different kinds of methods and tactics, everything from the disruptive civil disobedience of something like Stop the Oil, all the way, and, and I can now say this as an older person who's calmed down a little bit and is perhaps doesn't have the guillotine, you know, not, not dragging the guillotine behind me. But um, I think even going all nervous. the way, going all the way from disruptive civil disobedience to perhaps even um, legal recourse, um, find, um, filing lawsuits against polluters. Um, I think we need the whole range of local forms of organizing in order to be in solidarity with people across the world. But in order to be in solidarity with people across the world, we need to educate ourselves about the kinds of struggles they're engaging in. And I think that that's enormously important. Political education is one of the things that is, I think, fallen by the wayside quite a lot in the last 20, 30 years. And I think that that is something that we really should focus on. And, um, and, and, and it's hugely important, not only for the environment, but for so many other kinds of um, causes um, and, uh, and crises. Uh, we have a question from Nick that I imagine is intended for Jeremy. So I'm going to pose it to you first, but I would also really like to hear your perspective on it, Lala. Uh, Nick asks, I'd be interested in his advice to MPs wavering about breaking the whip, like what's actually so bad about being suspended from the PLP for six months? I'm, I'm not a member of the Parliamentary Labour Party anymore. I'm an independent MP. Um, when uh, my colleagues were voted the same way as I did to try and end the disgraceful two-child benefit cap. Um, I sort of said to them, well, well done on all this. And, um, and I spoke to some of them the next day and said, okay, what's happening now? They said, oh, it's only been withdrawn for six months. We, we'll get it back. And I said, yeah, they said that to me five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, so don't hold, your, don't hold your breath on that. No, the, the issue's got to be that two-child benefit cap is it, it, just immoral by any stretch of the imagination. You, you, so you're saying that the second, third, and fourth child of, uh, uh, sorry, third, fourth, and fifth child of a big family, each would get, give or take, £9,000 per year in universal credit benefit for them. So that family is being penalized by 27,000 pounds a year because they're a big family on universal credit. Are those children less valuable than the first two? It's just totally immoral. And the cost of um, ending it would be about 1.3 billion thereabouts. Well, that's not much compared to the amount they proposed to put up defense expenditure. And it wouldn't take much of a wealth tax to bring in 1.3 billion pounds uh, to pay for it. The question is priorities. So I see this as an absolutely key defining subject to campaign on now. And when the uh, chancellor comes up with her initial financial statement on Monday, it's being heavily trailed in all sorts of directions, uh, I'll be one of those that's there continuing to make this demand as a symbolic point that if we can lift that, um, that benefit cap, then it shows the direction in which us as the public, as public opinion, are prepared to make a noise and, and push in that direction. Why do we live in a society where we tolerate such poverty, such inequality, and so many people dependent on food banks just to survive? whilst at the same time they blather on about reducing the tax burden on the very richest people in our society. Bring it on, take the poorest out of tax and put more tax on the richest. I mean, I, 
I can't see into the minds of the people who choose to stay, but I suspect that part of the reason that people stay is out of loyalty, affection, all of, the, all of the work that they've put into the party for many years, but also because a political party does provide a certain degree of continuity, um, ability to campaign, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, which is why I'm going to ask Jeremy, why are you not starting a new party? Well, Sorry, I have to ask this. Question. Everybody it's perfectly, wanted me. It's a perfectly fair question. I get it all the time. People say, start a party. Announce it now. Invite me. This is the start. <laughs> hang on, guys. Hang on. <laughs> There's been about 15 attempts in the past 40 years to establish another party in Britain. Sadly, none of them have been very successful. It's a, a serious question, serious point. And so what I'm saying is, I don't know if... Uh, I broke the habits of a lifetime and wrote an article for The Guardian uh, <laughs> uh, uh, after, winning, um, after winning our election in Islington North because I wanted to make the point that how we'd won was by having very honest and very serious conversations with every single door that we knocked on. You couldn't turn up and say, hello, I'm the party candidate, are you voting for the party? And people say, yes, no, maybe, don't know, go away, S something better on the telly or something. Um, and you go away without actually having any conversation. We had to explain on every single doorstep why I was standing as an independent, what the principles of the campaign were, about peace, justice, equality, public ownership, and all those kind of issues. It's all about empowerment of people. And so what I hope will happen, and indeed is happening, is that we're gonna set up here a local community forum. It'll meet at least once a month. I'll report to it. Others will come to it and speak about housing, about health, international issues, lots of things. That will be the growth of an empowerment of people in a grassroots community that will very rapidly morph into a series of political demands on social justice, on environmental sustainability, on public ownership of these thieving water companies, and so on. A whole lot of things like that. These I see growing up all over. That will become a huge political force. Will you call it a party with a specific dot, 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 dot manifesto on every last item of policy? Immediately, no. But I tell you, over a pretty short time, it's going to become a very, very important political force and political voice that will change things. And because uh, I have spent my life campaigning, yes, I've been in the Labour Party all my life. I was expelled from the Labour Party 28 minutes after I announced I was standing as an independent candidate. They're a bit slow, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, and. Um, that is the work that I'm committed to doing and determined to do. And the other four colleagues that were elected as independent MPs, mainly but not solely on the issue of Gaza, we're working very closely together. We're working with the Green MPs, we're working with the SNP on some issues, we're working with Plaid Cymru on most issues, we're working with some of the Labour MPs on issues. We've only been there three weeks to doing this, but I tell you what, we are going to be there to make that voice of these kind of social demands. It's all about empowering of people because the media and the right in politics always want to disempower you, tell you there's nothing you can do. You've just got to put up with the market economy. You've just got to put up with being winners and losers in society. You've got to put up with being low-streamed in school and not achieving anything because you were rude to the teacher at the age of 14 or something. Hang on, let's try and empower people into understanding their rights and understanding the power of solidarity. Think of the great political changes that have happened. The, the bravery of those that stood up against the slave trade, those that stood up against the racism in the USA and elsewhere, those that stood up for the right to vote, those that stood up and died in Peterloo, and so on. There's a whole rich vein of history of people who empowered themselves and empowered and changed political movements. And that's what I'm serious about doing for the rest of my life. Thank you, and sorry about that.
Lala, earlier you said that what we really need is more political education, that what today, today's left in particular lacks is good political education. And we have a question from the audience along those lines from Adam. The right has seen a surge in popular theorists from academics, I'm gonna put that in scare quotes, like Jordan Peterson, <laughs> to more informal philosophers. Even bigger scare quotes. Like Andrew Tate. <laughs> Does the left have a problem making its theories as accessible and popular as the right? If so, why? Hmm. Um, and if you don't know who either of those people are, I'm happy to. I mean, I, I, I think you live in such very, it's an excellent yeah. question, and I think part of it is because I think the right um, understood certain things extremely well. Number one, the power of social media. The number two, the power of memes and symbols in ways that it took us on the left a little while to catch up. That's number one. I think number two is also, the f I actually see, I don't necessarily see a kind of a scarcity of good left theorists. There are a lot of really amazing left theorists. Um, I, and, and, and among us, probably loads of you have extremely good analyses of what is wrong with us. I think we have to build forums in which that voice can get out, that's number one. And I think part of what you were talking about, the, about the forum that you're building, uh, is, is incredibly important. But I also think that some of the things that you mentioned, the fact that you said you went and knocked on every door and you explained what you were doing, I think we need something like that that happens in um, schools, in churches, in community organizations, in youth organizations, in LGBT, in, um, and we need to have a lot of these, and that political education needs to happen in these groups. And by political education, I don't mean necessarily a reading group, although that's fantastic. I also mean passing on the histories and experiences of those who have had those experiences of organizing across decades so that we can learn and we don't repeat the same mistakes again and again and again and again, which, you know, as, as, I'm, as I'm getting older, I'm seeing that happen a lot more. So I think that's what I mean by political education. Yeah, and lastly to, to Jeremy, do we, do we need more charismatic weirdos on YouTube? What's the, what's the, state, the state of political education on the left as you see it? What we need is people understanding that political education is actually the experience of everyday life. It's everyday life, how you, how you live your life, what you do, and what solidarity or otherwise you show with other people. I mean, I've always felt an hour on a picket line is far more valuable than a week in a lecture theater, actually, because it does be you begin to understand what power structures and, and struggles are, are about um, because of that. But I do think um, the areas that I would look at profoundly are the education system we have and the teaching of history in our schools and that sense of lack of understanding of history. I mean, so many um, students going through secondary school, but primary and secondary school, have this sort of weird view of history that it's sort of um, Romans, Normans, Tudors, Victorians, <laughs> and the Second World War, and that's about it, really. Uh, and without any sort of context or connection that goes with it, there are some history teachers that are absolutely brilliant and manage to turn it into either local history, history of change, history of colonialism, all, all this absolutely brilliant. But they're not all doing that. And so if you think about it, your knowledge and perceptions of history actually have a huge framing of your views of the rest of the world. How do you promote the ideas of racism and racial superiority other than by promoting the ideas that somehow or other Europe was superior or is superior to the rest of the planet? That's why there was European colonialism and so on. And so it is about exploring these ideas and ensuring that um, our young people are brought up with a questioning and an inquiring mind that does begin to understand the great broad sweeps of history. Not easy to 
put over in a few minutes, but I think it's the attitudes and, and teaching that are so important. And whilst I, we all use mobile phones, we all use social media and so on, we learn a great deal from it. Actually, it's a bit hard to put forward a long and complicated political argument in 22, 22 lines on an X message, you know. You actually have to have some better way of communicating. I'm not, I'm, don't pretend to know all the answers to this. What I do know is, I'll finish on this, I know you want to stop, that if you open up people's ideas on imagination and so on, um, I've been doing the last year or so quite a lot of um, poetry evenings around the country, partly with this book we've done, Poetry for the Many. A lot of people come who mostly turn up and say, I've only come because I heard you've done this book, I hate poetry. So I say, great, it's nice of you to come, I hope you enjoy the evening. <laughs> uh, and then they start to start asking questions and taking part in discussion, because poetry can be, in a very healthy way, a sort of fly to the mind, bringing together lots of different ideas uh, and concepts. So it's a question of reaching out to people. We do the same with music and so many other things. Reach out to people. That rich experience of daily life can enrich us all and empower us all. Can I? I completely agree on the poetry. I love poetry literature. But I also want to say thank you to the TikTok generation. If you weren't doing what you were doing about Palestine, yeah, yeah. the US wouldn't try to ban you guys. So, well done you. So, there we have it. Read more poetry, watch more TikToks, <laughs> smash capitalism. Let me know how it goes. Put poetry on TikTok. Put poetry on TikTok. I'm sure people are. Someone, <laughs> Someone under 30, that. sort that out for me. Um, all that remains, I, you said that uh, we want to finish, of course, what we want to do is keep everyone hostage here for another like four hours and we still will only scratch the surface of all of the things that you have so um, ably, so bravely, so insightfully raised throughout the course of this evening. But on behalf of the Verso podcast and of course on behalf of The Dig, um, I'd like to wrap up there and remind you, of course, this is the moment, uh, to subscribe to the Verso podcast, sign up to the Verso book club, subscribe and support the Dig podcast, and of course, Macrodose. I would like to thank our wonderful MC, Dahlia Gabriel, who has done such a fantastic job tonight. And that's political education too. Actually, all three of those podcasts and a few others are real good political education. So, there you go. I, I, I said nothing. I didn't even pay her to say that yet. Um, so thank you then to our Macrodose panelists. We had Asad Raymond, Thea Ria Francos, and James Meadway. I'd also like to thank the Union Chapel for this fantastic, beautiful venue. My goodness, what a privilege. And to our friends and colleagues at Planet B Productions and of course to Space 4 who have done the, the most possible to help nourish us and nurture us as an independent production company. So thank you so much. And of course, join me please in raising this beautiful roof for our panelists, Lila Khalili and MP Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> say Daniel Pop? I think uh, I'm gonna get a beer you don't have to go home but you can't stay here thank you so much for joining us thank you, so much for coming, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.